Predictive policing was once full of promise, promises that have, have not been fulfilled as issues arise and many police forces abandon the approach. Our EU funded research project, Cutting Crime Impact, is helping two law enforcement agencies to tackle some of the issues with predictive policing and develop some practical answers. This has involved asking the question, what is the role of predictive policing in modern policing? I'm Professor Caroline Davey from the University of Salford, the coordinator of the Cutting Crime Impact Project. The Landis Criminal Amt, in English, that's the State Office for Criminal Investigation in the federal state of Lower Saxony in Germany, introduced their own predictive policing system, PreMap, in 2016. I'm joined by Max Querbach from the LKA. Max, can you tell us a little bit about the introduction of predictive policing in Lower Saxony? and what your research found regarding its use in policing. Yes, thank you, Caroline, for introducing. Um, we started, as you just said, our predictive policing approach with an in-house development um, due to the current development over the globe with predictive policing in 2016. Um, as I said, it was an in-house development because we didn't want to um, purchase an externally developed black box by uh, a company and we want to have you know the power over the data and what is happening and with with all the data and everything so the main focus of the premap um, system is basically on the based on the near repeat approach uh, it predicts only domestic burglary crimes and um, only police data from domestic burglary is uh, implemented in our police case management system are used for the predictions and uh, the main factors are like time location um, t the type of intrusion stolen goods whatsoever and on the basis of that uh, it is predictive to what uh, likelihood another burglary will happen in the next 24 to 48 hours and based on that uh, it is tried to well tackle those uh, predictions with adequate measures like focused patrolling in those areas like risk areas and the risk areas are of radius of 500 meters um, not squares where it's or grids most of the other systems use that we use like uh, circle yeah it's, it's a prediction within a circle based around that yeah okay thank you and you undertook research on how premap was actually being used by police officers as part of the cutting crime impact project what what did you find as a result of that research yeah um first well, PreMap was was evaluated before, but not in the type how it was implemented or how it was used in the daily policing practice. It was more used on how the algorithm was working and uh, how the risk areas are predicted and everything, the value of it, of the predictions. Who was, well, not that satisfying uh, as anyone thought, you know, before they developed it, it was a lot of hope in the in the new development of this technology and as we began our um, cci project and looking for uh, developing like tailored toolkits for bringing predictive policing to another level specifically in lower saxony you know and develop like toolkits just for for us uh, based on the our current situation i um, undertook um, observations during patrol uh, with patrol officers and interviewed also different people involved in the um, implemented pre-map process like we uh, defined roles during implementation of pre-map for officers and for the precinct who are responsible for um, some parts of the whole process so i interviewed them how it was implemented 
and also how officers use it in their daily work. And the results were really um, eye-opening, to be honest, because um, you think you roll out uh, new technology and people just apply it into their daily work. And the thing is, that's basically not what happened. A lot of people had some issues with the whole usability because it was uh, mainly developed for using it on tablets within their cars. It's just, a, actually it's just a map uh, on which you can see uh, the defined risk areas. A um, lot of officers said that they, it's not user friendly, that they don't really use it at all because they don't need it in their car to see where the risk area is. They just need, before they shift a the notification, within your um, patrolling area, in this specific area, there is a risk area patrol there. There was an, also other problems concerning um, data values, uh, how data was implemented into PreMap, but also that people, especially officer from patrol, didn't see any benefit of the whole approach, you know, because they, they thought the effectiveness couldn't be measured, which is a general problem in predictive policing. And uh, I think one of the main problems is was for officers that they don't get any feedback out of the program. You know, when you patrol to a risk, uh, a risk area and nothing happens, you can't really measure if it didn't happen because you patrolled there or the prediction was just wrong. So, um, that was one main issue, but there was also like no really communication. So even though the uh, premap was implemented uh, with a overall structure and how it uh, should be communicated down to the patrol officers, but the thing is that it was really depending on individual preferences of people in charge, uh, how patrol officers got their information about risk areas and how people were briefed about uh, in general crime information, crime incidents, prediction areas whatsoever. And so we saw a general lack there that there was no standardization of communicating um, crime data, prediction data. And then the problem was after it first was uh, launched, you know, it, well, um, never gotten really implemented just some few few officers who were interested in it uh, looked at it and used it and some didn't so it, that was a really major lag i guess that it was no overall structured implementation and process of communicating every data they needed thank you max i mean implementation there seems to be a really um key issue I mean, what's interesting is that um, predictive policing is often actually a commercial product um, that law enforcement agencies are expected to invest in, but then they actually fail to implement. What, you know, why is that? Um, I coordinate Cutting Crime Impact um, together with Andrew Wooten. He's a product designer and adopts a human-centered design approach to product and service development. Andrew, can you provide some insight into this? Hi, Caroline. Um, I think that um, the problem is that uh, too often the technologies are, are not actually uh, designed per se. Um, they embody a particular technological capability. Uh, in this case, the ability to map data or to plot crime data and risk onto maps. Uh, and often the, the solutions lack an appropriate design consideration of the real world context. So how they will actually be used um, in this case within a policing context and all of the other pressures that uh, fall on the officers and the responsibilities they have. Uh, but equally, how will these technologies be fed with uh, relevant and accurate data? So too little consideration is often given to the uh, accuracy and the, con and the consistency of the data that's fed into the system by the human users uh, and also uh, how human users interpret and understand the outputs of such systems um, and how these outputs will actually be used. 
uh, presenting the data on a map means automatically human users will make assumption about accuracy that may actually be unfounded. So if you only have postcode data uh, presenting it as dots on maps or locations on maps, people will automatically think that that's an actual uh, physical location in real uh, in geographical space when that might not actually be the case. Um, and we find that this is happening uh, uh, what's happening currently in, in predictive policing with so many police forces actually either questioning or stopping altogether using it uh, reflects more on the, a lack of a human-centered design approach to the adoption of the technology rather than the technology being of no value in itself. Um, so there needs to be more focus on how these technologies can be designed to actually support the police officers who are responsible for policing and for preventing crime rather than in some way to replace them uh, in some way or to replace some aspect of their role with the technology being seen as some sort of panacea or a magic wand in some way. So Max talked about some real implementation issues at the um, LKA regarding predictive policing. Andrew, how did CCI help the LKA to address the issues identified from the research? So CCI has been structured around uh, the design development process. Um, and this consists of several phases of divergent and convergent thinking. Um, so at the start of the project, the first stage um, is the discover phase, where our police partners explored their focus areas using a range of different research methods. And the aim here is really to explore the subject and is driven by curiosity rather than any agenda. Uh, and this is not as easy to do as it may sound. People naturally will cling to their initial assumptions about an issue, uh, but by really exploring the area thoroughly and seeking to understand all the different perspectives involved, then you can develop valuable insights for the next phase, which is the define phase, which is actually convergent thinking. So you're looking to try and um, define um, the aim and the scope uh, of the problem. Uh, and in many cases, this is where the focus of the project is actually redefined. Um, and you discover that your initial assumptions of issues perhaps have been incorrect or that the situation is more complex than you at first thought. And then having defined the problem in this defined stage, you then um, set about uh, with your design brief uh, starting the next phase, which involves divergent thinking again, as you explore different ways in which the solution to that brief might be developed. And this again involves research, including prototype testing of different ideas and talking to end users and other stakeholders. And then finally, um, in the deliver phase, you will uh, um, deliver the design solution. So you're then focusing down uh, convergent thinking on delivering the design solution uh, and, and getting to a sort of final designed outcome. Then that is deployed in some way and the impact uh, and effectiveness of this is then digested over time. Uh, and then the principle is that this experience of using this solution that you've designed over time may in fact lead to another opportunity or problem that can be fed into the next uh, sort of design cycle if you like. So Max, were your assumptions challenged through the CCI process? What was the design solution that you developed and how does it meet the needs of the LKA? Yes, uh, I would totally say so because uh, what Andrew just described is with, with the things you think think about before you actually develop something that you only already have the solution because of your profession your assumptions assumptions because of your knowledge of of the things you um you work with uh, before even the re requirement capture phase me me and a colleague and some other colleagues sat together and uh, already thought about 
the outcome of the project, you know, what would be the toolkit we needed and we thought about a more sophisticated algorithm and whatsoever. And as I described before, um, that wasn't even the problem. Well, of course, it's a general problem with the predictions, as we know, and finding the right factors and uh, uh, the effectiveness of, of the whole approach. But um, what we experienced uh, during the research phase here was that you can have the most sophisticated tool and technology whatsoever if it's not rightfully implemented in a, into an institution and its management and how uh, the institution works. It's not going to work at all, you know, because people don't, uh, are not going to use it at all because they don't uh, know how it works, they don't understand it, it's not communicated at all. And th there is uh, why, um, where we try to um, develop a process, like a communication process in which predictive policing is just a part of a wider uh, crime um, data or crime information uh, communication process. So we developed, or we, we are, currently developing a process in which we standardize the briefing, how uh, patrol officers are briefed with relevant um, crime information because like risk areas appear maybe once a week in your patrol area. So it's not like the, your daily business. There's a lot of other information you need for besides your professional uh, individual knowledge. And we try to bring everything the knowledge and the database from analytics and uh, everything together into one place so that patrol officers are briefed and informed properly. And this, uh, that our predictive policing approach is just one part in this whole process uh, of uh, information flowing through the whole institution. That's what we're trying then to achieve to make it one part of a general process. Thank you. Another aspect of CCI is its focus on social and ethical issues. With regard to predictive policing, a number of ethical issues have made headlines recently. We know that the LKO chose to develop its own predictive policing system as a way to mitigate some of these ethical issues. Dr. Oscar Gastrein from the University of Groningen has been exploring some of these issues. Oscar, perhaps you could give us some introduction to some of the issues that are relevant to predictive policing. Yes, thank you, Caroline. And um, as you mentioned, as a partner of the Cutting Crime Impact Project, uh, we are responsible for uh, ethical and social issues, but the part of that is also, and I'd actually like to start with that aspect. Um, the analysis of the legal framework as well. And um, as it's very well known for applications like predictive policing, which are often using large amounts of data or so-called big data to uh, come up with predictions, um, there is first and foremost the issue that even although in Europe we have a very well evolved uh, framework when it comes to issues like privacy or using data where the basic rule is that you can only use data if you have um, a legitimate legal basis for that. Um, that uh, even in that kind of environment, it's still very difficult uh, to regulate uh, the application uh, and use of technologies like predictive policing because um, then the legal framework simply hinges so much on the individual and it's very difficult then to, uh, on the one hand, have these like large amounts of data uh, and on the other hand, then operating in a legal framework that um, is so focused on the individual. And that is just to say that uh, here in this uh, area of application, really ethical and societal concerns count even more. And uh, when it comes specifically to those, I mean, uh, I think it has already been outlined very well uh, by the speakers that we already heard that on the one hand, there is this uh, issue 
that the promise of the technology as such um, has uh, underlying assumptions which just hold, don't hold true when you try to actually really fight crime. So simply, crime is uh, much more complex than uh, just using, uh, you know, being able to predict it by using a lot of data and then just putting it into a data model. And there are many reasons for that. Um, one of those reasons could be that the people who are designing those systems, uh, even when it's the police themselves, um, they, they have uh, difficulties in, uh, in really uh, understanding how the reality then uh, on, the, on the ground will look uh, for the officers or that the so social factors which are impacting crime are just so much more complex that it's a, a, an impossible task to select the right data and combine it in the right way, maybe also with data which is not only related to crime or historic crime records like weather data or street patterns or things like that. And then bring all, to, all this together in a, in a simple, so to speak, visualization uh, which then could help us uh, telling agents, yes, on, on this day, under these conditions, you just need to go there and let's say a burglary or a bicycle theft is going to happen. So that is the, the one aspect that just, it turns out more and more uh, that the whole promise of the technology just doesn't hold true because crime as a phenomenon seems to be too complex. On the other hand, what we heard, I think, also very well is that the implementation of such technologies uh, and, and the use of this data in LEAs uh, themselves is extremely complex. And what we see is that on the one hand, um, there are uh, humans working who are um, using their experience and their, their skill sets and, and you know, just their instincts uh, to do what they think is best to, to handle the situations. And of course, data can play an enhancing role in that. We're not, I don't have, absolutely don't have the opinion that there is not a role for data and technology to play in this, but we really have to think uh, very carefully about how to do this. And I mean, Andrew has already outlined that yeah, one way to, to uh, integrate that is this human-centered design approach. Um, but also I think uh, it helps just to think much, much more uh, thoroughly about the purpose and the use of, of this data. And I think uh, the, the design process that we're using in the CCI process, uh, in the CCI project definitely helps with that. Thank you. So thank you for joining me today. If you'd like to find out more about the CCI project, then please visit our website. That's www.cuttingcrimeimpact.eu. And thank you for listening and goodbye.